on Business Incorporated. IATA releases global air cargo traffic, says demand continues its strong growth trend. World Bank President said Sudan's economic situation is improving but will require patience. Algeria has to reduce income tax amid soaring food prices. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwabu. We kick off with the major stock markets so starting off here on the African continent where numbers were green at intraday. Nigeria's main index inched higher by 0.06%, while South Africa's JSC index increased by 0.4% at intraday. Similarly, Egypt's benchmark performance index arose by 0.3%. The Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Friday's session positive. Over to the Middle East where sentiment were mixed at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index fell by 0.27%, while Dubai's main index traded lower at 0.76%. Elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia and the Qatari indices rose by 0.15%, and 0.43% each at intraday. And in Europe, markets kicked off the first full trading week of the month, focused on concerns around inflation, Federal Reserve tapering, rising interest rates, and Evergrande. Let's hear more from Chelsea. Hello, Chelsea. Good afternoon. Well, trading in Europe kicked off this week in the red. What's driving the somber mood? Well, Jimmy, you mentioned uh, several of the big drivers here today. I'd say what's in, in focus mostly for markets is Evergrande, the continuing drama around this massive Chinese developer that owes about 300 billion euros, uh, excuse me, dollars to its investors and its creditors. Today, we did hear uh, that Evergrande is, is likely going to sell part of its property services business to another company, raise about $5 billion from that sale. But it still seems to have investors around the world spooked because of just how enormous this company is. They have uh, really their, their hands in all parts of the Chinese economy and many thousands of people are employed by Evergrande. More people, more than a million uh, people have put down deposits for houses that haven't been built yet. So there's still a lot of concern that the collapse of Evergrande could have really widespread implications for the Chinese economy. But the other thing that's really in focus is inflation. Uh, last week we got an inflation reading here in Europe, saw it at the highest level in a decade. So there's been this narrative that inflation is only temporary, that it's going to pass uh, in the coming months. But now that we are seeing more sustained pressure, and, and it's particularly the supply chain and energy shortages, a lot of people are starting to reassess how likely it is that uh, this, this inflation increase might be here to stay, which would be a massive shift for markets. In the meantime, uh, European finance ministers are meeting today to discuss the mounting energy crisis in Europe. What can we expect? Well, European energy, uh, European finance ministers, European governments are under an enormous amount of pressure right now because we are seeing a, a very dramatic increase in energy costs. This year alone, we've seen prices for natural gas here in Europe rise by about 300% on the wholesale market, and that is filtering through into higher prices for consumers, for businesses, for really all parts of the economy. So uh, governments are, are trying to step in and limit the, the blowback from that. We've already seen France, Italy, and Spain say that they're are going to cap costs for uh, for households, but they also want the EU to step in, and that's like likely what they will be discussing today. There's been discussion over whether they could cut some some taxes to bring down prices, whether they the EU could give more support to countries so that they uh, can help subsidize those costs for for households. But they also likely will talk a bit more uh, broadly about this as well. One of the big issues is the supply of natural gas from Russia. Uh, Russia is a major supplier to. Europe and it's likely only to become more important as the natural gas sup supplier to Europe as this Nord Stream 2 pipeline gets up and running. Um, but this is raising a lot of concerns because we have seen uh, shipments from Russia go down this year and uh, that's one of the main reasons why we're, we're seeing this power crunch right now. So there likely will be talk as well of, over whether Europe needs to uh, really diversify its supply and not be so dependent on Russia. 
So how big of a threat is the energy crisis to Europe's economic recovery? Well, it's becoming realer and realer by the day. Uh, this year, we've seen prices for electricity rise by about 20% for households. That's really an enormous uh, increase in cost for a lot of people, particularly uh, the most vulnerable, the poorest households. We're looking at a situation where electricity costs could become really unaffordable for a lot of people, especially as we head into the winter uh, when demand goes up and when prices are likely to rise as well. So uh, that's definitely a concern because people, if they're facing these big energy costs, they might cut back in spending in other parts of the uh, economy. As well, businesses are, are really struggling this, with this. We've seen, not so much here in Europe, but in, in the UK, we've seen some energy firms uh, collapse because of these costs. It's just made it too expensive. We've seen in, in China uh, companies having to uh, cut back their production or having to, to shut down because they just can't afford the, the electricity prices. So it really could become a major threat to, to the economy if, if there isn't a, a solution in the months ahead. Well, I guess we'll continue to keep a watch on that energy crisis there. Thank you very much, Chelsea. And um, in the UK, shares in Morrison's fell today after the US firm wins auction to take over the supermarket chain. Juliana has the details. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon and happy to have you back. So happy to see you, Jimmy. So, Morrison's takeover battle seems to have ended. However, while we saw Morrison's shares falling this morning, shares in Sainsbury was rising. What are investors thinking? Well, absolutely. Our um, a pretty um, highly watched Netflix series of the takeover of Morrison's has come to an end. And um, as you said, on Saturday, Chimaze, um, it was Clayton Dubilio and Rice, um, the very popular U.S. private equity firm that won the bidding just by one pence per share, uh, knocking Fortress um, off uh, the mantle. Uh, but Fortress now have got over £7 billion to play with, which is why there's lots of speculation within uh, the square mile that Sainsbury's um, could potentially uh, be the next um, supermarket that's grabbed um, by private equity. Of course, we had um, the TDR group and the ISA brothers taking over Asda. Then we had this uh, back and forth with Morrisons and there's still more to play with. The reason why uh, nobody's talking about Tesco, which is Britain's most popular supermarket, is because it's just too expensive. And um, investors, when they um, heard about this speculation and this rumours, that's one of the reasons why Sainsbury's shares are up. Tesco and Ocado, their shares are also up. As you were saying, though, Morrison's at early trade, their shares were down by about 3.3%. And that's because investors aren't really sure what happens next. Where does Morrison's go? It is one of the largest private sector um, uh, uh, pay um, employers in the UK. What happens to all of these jobs? They've also got massive land portfolio, which is one of uh, the reasons why um, investors uh, were piqued uh, at the possible purchase of Morrison. So yes, it's still very unknown, but the season has come to an end. Uh, but now I think over the next couple of months, we're probably going to be talking about a Sainsbury's takeover, aren't we? I guess so. Anyway, in other takeover news, struggling UK fashion chain French Connection has accepted a £29 million approach. Tell us more. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad day for shoppers, but not for investors. Uh, French Connection, for the first time in a very, very long time, their shares were up 18%, and that is because they have finally um, uh, found a takeover, and this has come from their largest uh, shareholder. They've sold the business for £29 uh, million, pounds, which, if you think about it, a few years ago... It peak, uh, French Connection UK was worth over £500 million. Pounds. It was the creme de la creme if you were wearing it and you could afford it. But that was one of the issues. Um, they were losing money left, right and centre and they struggled uh, to keep up with competitors that came onto the market, such as Zara, such as Topshop. I know Topshop is now gone, but at the time, um, it really did take all of their cost customers. Uh, they were losing money a uh, year after years um, and they haven't actually gained any money for about uh, 10 years. So for bosses, this is great, especially their founder. He gets to go home with a £12 uh, million pounds, uh, payday. But yes, uh, you know, as we've been discussing on your show, Chimise, for over 18 months, the pandemic has really exacerbated uh, some of the major issues that the British high street um, has faced. And another one bites the dust with FC UK. Mm. 
Well, it's a new trading week and, of course, a new month and new quarter. How has trading been? What are driving the sentiments? Yeah, the FTSE actually started off a bit flat, a subdued start to the beginning of um, the new trading week and the beginning of the new trading um, month, but it's slightly picked up at intraday. The FTSE All Share at the moment is up 0.10%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.51%, but the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's down by 0.31%. In currencies, there's a strong pound, the British pound, up on the US dollar by 0.30%, also up on the euro by 0.02%, and up on the Japanese yen by 0.48 percent. As I was saying, that uh, takeover on the weekend has really push, pushed up the grocers, Ocado, Tesco, Sainsbury's, all trading up. And of course, there has been the slash of the Amberlist. So no longer an Amberlist to travel into the UK. It's either go or no go. So red, not red. And there is speculation potentially that the red list will be reduced from 54 countries to nine. And that pushed up the shares of international consolidated airlines, the parent owner of British Airways. Interesting. All right, I guess we still have more to track on the space there. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, Jimmy. And Asian markets were mixed Monday trade with the Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong tumbling more than 2% following its return from a Friday holiday. As of its final hour of trading, the Hang Seng Index was down 2.24%. Trading on the shares of China Evergrande was halted as investor concerns surrounding the indebted property developer returned. In Japan, the K225 shared 1.13%. While the topics index dipped 0.62%. Australian stocks jumped on the day with the S&P ASS 200 up 1.29%. MSCI's broadest index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan slipped around 0.3%. And in the U.S. stock futures indicator that markets will open in the red today, kicking off the new week and in the negative the Dow Jones futures was down 0.29%, S&P futures was down 0.33%, and Nasdaq down 0.49%. And to the global oil market, prices fell in early trade today ahead of an OPEC plus supply policy meeting that may decide whether a recent rally in prices can be sustained as the world recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic, Brent crude was down 24 cents to $79.04 per barrel. It rose 1.5% last week, its fourth weekly gain in a row. U.S. oil dropped by 27 cents to $75.61 after rising for the past six weeks. Oil prices have risen amid supply disruptions and recovering global demand, pushing Brent last week to an almost three-year high above $80. OPEC Plus, which groups uh, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries and allies, including Russia, is scheduled to meet later in the day. And to metals now, gold prices aired down in early trade with a firmer dollar dimming bullion's appeal as investors eye a key U.S. jobs report later this week that could influence the Federal Reserve's timeline for tapering its asset purchases. Spot gold fell 0.1% to $1,759 per ounce after hitting $1,755, its highest since September 23. U.S. gold futures rose 0.1% to $1,759, providing some support to safe haven billion, however, where concerns over the broader economic impact of Chinese property developer Evergrande's debt crisis, which weighed on risk sentiment. In all the metals, silver was down 0.1% at $22.51 an ounce. Platinum fell 0.1% to $971.22 and palladium dropped 0.5% to $1,908. After the break, we'll bring you an update on the Zambia's debt talk. This and more in a moment. As talks between Zambia and international lenders kicked off last week, it was revealed that Zambia's outstanding external debt to Chinese financiers is approximately $6.6 billion, almost double the $3.4 billion revealed by the previous Zambian government. The revelations detailed in a research paper by the China Africa Research Institute reinforce 
concerns over a lack of transparency and complicate debt restructuring talks with the 17 Chinese lenders involved. Well, Matt Kindiger, Associate Practice Lead at Sub-Saharan Africa at Frontier View, uh, will weigh into this. Hey, Matt, good to see you. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the program today. So Zambia's uh, new president hosted the IMF last week. How will these um, developments affect the prospects of Zambia reaching a deal with the IMF? Uh, yeah, so quite a significant development, or, although not entirely surprising. So in our view, it probably won't materially affect the chances of Zambia reaching a deal with the IMF. Uh, and this is because uh, the IMF probably... Uh, guessed that there was a high level of debt owed to Chinese or higher level of Chinese loans than previously uh, announced by the government. Uh, generally, uh, the Zambian government and the IMF are both very keen to do a deal uh, and form some sort of arrangement, uh, but it does suggest that the renegotiation of Zambia's debt uh, to its private lenders, so restructuring of, it, of its external debt, of its external debt, uh, could take longer, could involve uh, much more difficult negotiations. Uh, and this is because private bondholders uh, on which Zambia defaulted last year uh, are likely to view Zambia as being much higher risk. So certainly, although uh, we don't think it will delay an IMF deal, there is likelihood, or there is a strong likelihood that it could delay Zambia exiting the vault over the next couple of months. Okay, with global copper prices at multi-year high, will the government be able to um, avoid painful fiscal adjustment? Yeah, so that's the, that's the big question at the moment. So public finances are certainly under severe pressure. And when uh, Mr. Hichilema was elected in August, he made it clear that some degree of painful fiscal adjustment was on the way. Uh, at the same time, as you've said, copper prices are very high. Uh, they're, they are at multi-year highs. And this means that we are seeing an up upswing in, in investment and the growth outlook for Zambia has improved quite considerably over the last couple of months. However, the increase in copper prices will not be enough to compensate for the very uh, difficult fiscal position that the government is in. Uh, HLM's new government has said that uh, fiscal, the fiscal position is worse than previously expected. So in any event, we are expecting quite aggressive fiscal consolidation, you know, with or without an IMF deal as well. Uh, and so we, we do expect taxes to rise and there are likely to be spending cuts over the next couple of months. Now, given the country's fiscal pressures, just as you mentioned, how have businesses responded to President Hitchinema's first couple of months in office? Yeah, so I would say generally the scorecard has been quite good for Mr. Hichilema, uh, despite the, the fiscal pressures that the, government, that, that the country is facing. Uh, sentiment is quite upbeat, and this is illustrated by the series of very sharp appreciations that the Quacha went through after Mich Mr. Hichilema came to power. Portfolio investors are, are quite enthusiastic about his ability to reach a deal with the IMF, and as we've already discussed, uh, copper prices are quite high. So generally, despite the fiscal pressures, uh, despite the problems that the government is facing uh, with its finances, the private sector is generally quite upbeat. We are expecting uh, Mr. Hichilema to work quite hard to attract investment, particularly into uh, mining, but also manufacturing and agriculture. So certainly uh, there are some pos positive prospects and uh, an upbeat outlook for Zambia, uh, as it deals with its fiscal pressures that it's facing. Hmm. Well, Matt, we do appreciate your time on the program as always. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks very much. And World Bank's President David Malpass says Sudan's economic situation is gradually improving. David Malpass, on a visit to Khartoum, also urged patience as the country seeks to tackle shortages and attract investment. Sudan has been mired in a crisis that led to the overthrow of former leader Omar al-Bashir in 2019 and has continued since. It remains politically fragile and thousands staged pro-democracy protests on Thursday, September the 30th, following an attempted coup last week. David Malpas is the World Bank's first president in decades to visit Sudan, 
which faced extensive sanctions under Omar al-Bashir. Sudan is making a transition uh, from, from, uh, from uh, a violent situation, uh, from a situation of shortages uh, to the situation uh, that is gradually improving. It takes time to go through this process. Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, who met with Malpas, says inflation had slowed slightly to 388 percent and that a sharply devalued currency had shown signs of stabilizing. The trade deficit declined year on year to $1.2 billion in the first half of 2021. But many Sudanese are struggling with poverty, shortages of medicines and power cuts. Shortages of fuel and of bread are, 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 uh, have, have improved substantially. And I think there can also be improvement on the electricity side. Uh, it's going to mean higher prices uh, at, 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 at the right time as the reforms are put forward. But that brings in more supply and that can really help uh, Sudan have more access. Over the next year, the bank says it will commit around $2 billion in grants to help tackle poverty and inequality, including hundreds of millions over the next two months for budget support, electricity improvements, and irrigation projects. An Algerian president, Abdul Majid Tebun has ordered his government to reduce tax on overall income amid soaring food prices in the drought-hit North African country. Avoiding social unrest has been a priority for authorities in Algeria, where the middle class has been hit by soaring prices for some food products. The government has blamed speculation for the upward trend of prices, including vegetables, fruits and meat, prompting it to tighten control at markets. The president has stressed the need to take all measures to preserve the purchasing power. And the International Air Transport Association has released data for global air cargo markets for August 2021, showing that demand continued its strong growth trend. The data by the global airlines regulator indicates that comparisons between 2021 and 2020 monthly results are distorted by the extraordinary impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which followed a normal demand pattern. According to the data, global demand measured in cargo ton kilometers was up 7.7% compared to August 2019 and was 8.6% for international operations. Overall growth, according to the data, remains strong compared to the long-term average growth trend of around 4.7%. The pace of growth, according to the data, slowed slightly compared to July, which saw demand increase 8.8% against pre-COVID-19 levels. And that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Ubi Iwago.